Can you see my screen? Yes. Ah, okay. All right. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Dr. Wong. So today we're going to have a small uh, sharing on this uh, V60 Philip uh, non-invasive ventilator. And um, so this is a very nice picture of Holland. Um, I I'm, I'm hope that uh, I will not send you to Holland, <laughs> like a Chinese saying, Dai <laughs> So, um, uh, the, 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 the talk will be like uh, uh, many online uh, sharing of some basic uh, important uh, information uh, about the non-invasive ventilator, a little bit of history and also mainly focus on the technical part uh, rather than um, uh, academic parts that uh, oh, you can read uh, day to day. Yeah. First of all, then we will talk about uh, respiratory support and um, a lot of times uh, uh, they are divided into two. So whether you, you, you support the uh, patient's uh, respirations either with uh, oxygen, which is oxygenation or ventilation. So if you could see the scenario in, uh, in uh, uh, India nowadays, uh, people are sh uh, shortage of uh, oxygen. And um, the way they are using oxygen, using high flow, uh, rebreathing mass of oxygen, that will cause a, quite a significant wastage and uh, drainage of the oxygen very fast. Because uh, as you know that uh, to use a uh, high flow oxygen rebreathing mass, you have to have a minimum of uh, 10 to 15 liter per minute. So they will drain the oxygen very, very fast. So when you talk about oxygenation, and you, we actually have to always remember we only supply the oxygen. Either you're giving through the nasal prong, or either you're giving through a venti mask, the venturi mask, or a rebuilding bag. So you actually create an ambience, an area uh, which is full of oxygen or, or enriched with oxygen, but you did not do any ventilation at all. The simple definition of ventilation is basically moving air in and out uh, in, a, in a confined space. Like for example, if you're in a room, so if the ventilation in the room uh, is good, then you feel very comfortable because the air can move in and out. But just imagine you are in a small box or in, in, a, in a, a room that without any ventilation, you feel suffocated, you feel that your breathing is not very good. So because there's not much of air in and out, so if you're giving oxygenation, you do not encourage, you do not provide the air in and out. What, whatever that you give is basically an uh, area that and only enriched with oxygen, with various, with various concentration of oxygenation that we're usually uh, determined by the fraction inspired oxygenation in terms of percentage. Whereas on the other hand, that we, whatever that we are going to discuss today, um, involve two mechanisms, which is importantly oxygenation and, and as well as ventilation. So this can be provided by either a uh, high flow nasal cannula, right, and uh, non-invasive ventilator, and as well as invasive ventilator. So these three important mechanisms provide ventilation. So oxygenation mainly concentrating on improving the uh, oxygen content. Ventilation is more towards like carbon dioxide exchange uh, as, a, uh, as a general rule. Hope you all can hear me. Eh? You can hear me clearly. You can hear me, right? <laughs> okay. Can, huh? Okay, all right. So uh, when you think of we can hear you, we can hear you. Ah, uh, good, good, great, thanks. <laughs> I just get that I just talked to the computer because now it's very difficult <laughs> to take uh, taking an online one. That sometimes I just spoke to the screen. <laughs> okay, so now we come come to the non invasion non invasive ventilation. So when you talk about non invasive ventilations, um, so these are four main components of the non invasive ventilation. We start out with uh, negative pressure ventilation. 
high flow nasal cannula, uh, you might say that it might be a, a, just a high flow, but then actually it involves in certain degree of uh, uh, ventilations, right? Continuous positive airway pressure, which is commonly is a CPAP, or bilevel positive airway pressure, which is two level, right? Uh, two level of CPAP. Let's go to a bit of history. The ventilation basically start out with uh, this, uh, the non-invasive ventilation started with this uh, iron lung, which is invented uh, in 1929 by a drinker and so. So this is the very first prototype that uh, they are created. So which means that uh, the man will be put inside the iron, iron box, all right? So this iron box, what this iron box basically did is that it's it changing the pressure within the iron box itself. Right. So during inspiration, the iron box itself will create a negative pressure uh, around the patient body, which is confined into this iron box. With that, it's going to generate a negative pressure surrounding, okay, and then pulling out uh, the the lung, right? So when, you, when the lung are being pulled out, okay, and the air will going to inspire, right? the air will going to inspire, and on the other hand. For exhalations, so the ambient pressure around the patient body within the iron cabinet will increase the pressure, hence it's push out the gas. Okay. For, for this ventilation to be effective, the lung, the patient's lung has to be normal, right? Non-pathological. And that's why the, the, the time that when they invented this uh, uh, ventilation is during the polio outbreak. As you know, during the polio, the disease of polio usually is involved the spinal cord and subsequently leading to paralysis. So in this patient with paralysis, right, so they, there will be no problem in terms of their lung. Okay? And uh, because of that, then they can easily manage with this mechanism. And this negative, uh, non negative uh, pressure ventilation is not suitable for the patient who have problem of uh, uh, a lot of problem of primary lung pathology, which is uh, like pneumonia. So because of this pressure might not generate uh, enough pressure to inhale the gas. Right. Also, if the patient has significant uh, secretion of pseudo palsy or couldn't ever able to maintain the airway, so this mechanism is, is, is not the appropriate way to go. This is a very nice illustration during the polio outbreak last time how the patients are nursed in this uh, cabinet, the so-called the iron lung. And uh, where patients are put into cabinets, there's a door here for, for, the, for the nurses to go in and out. The head are, uh, go out, uh, are put outside and then they are confined within this uh, small little, big little uh, uh, room. And when the nurses go into the room, they can nurse this patient. You can see that these all are polio patients. They need spleen for the lower limb, okay? Uh, for, uh, to, for to prevent contracture. Other than that, uh, the creativity come in whereby it is quite difficult to nurse a patient in the iron lung. This is another important uh, uh, ventilations. All right, we call it cuirass. Cuirass is the, uh, this arm, the arm cuirasses. So the cuirasses, what cuirasses do is that they concentrate the negative pressure only within this uh, chest wall. Yeah. So this test wall, uh, from, from here, this is a more uh, concentrated area rather than the whole area. They create negative pressure and positive pressure. Hence, in, it will change the, uh, the connect, uh, will, will, will suck in the air uh, through, through this mechanism. This is one of the nice pictures of how cuirasses was used last time during the polio outbreak. So this is the, 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 the pump to suck in air and then blow air in, okay? And then this is the patients, with the polio patients that have the cuirasses inside too. So all this is uh, the, some history about the negative pressure ventilation. So now go, let's go to the basic a little bit, uh, uh, the oxygen, uh, uh, and then subsequently we go to the high flow nasal cannula. You just concentrate on the graph. So when you inhale, when you do some inspiratory process, so when you inhale, this is the flow of the air that going in into our body, okay? Then after that, subsequently, you exhale. This is the exhalation, all right? 
So inhalation process, exhalation process, the inhalation process you see talk about, uh, uh, so the ratio is about one to two, right? So one to two, right, ratio, inspiration, expiration, right? So for inspiration to occur, uh, most of the time at the peak, this is what we call a peak inspiratory flow rate. So this peak inspiratory flow rate is the maximum flow rate that we inhale comfortably, yeah? Uh, the maximum flow rate that we can get. How much does it uh, uh, varies in, in, in patients? So like for adult example, so our peak inspiratory flow rates range about 40 to 60 liter per minute. Okay, 40 to 60 liter per minute type of flow, right? Whereas in children, particularly, because their size are varies, right? They can be three kilo small neonates and then up to about uh, 30 kilo uh, 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 a bigger child. So their inspiratory, peak inspiratory flow rate usually we calculate based on per kilo, estimated per kilo. So usually about one liter per kilo per minute type of uh, inspiratory flow, which means, for example, is a, is a, if it is a neonate, uh, it took about, which is three kilogram, so it will be about the peak inspiratory flow rate for the new net up to here, it will be about three liter, okay? For a child of 10 kilogram, so this peak inspiratory flow rate will more or less is about 10 liter, right? Okay, so that's kind of a peak inspiratory flow rate, okay? So with that concept in mind, okay? So for, for example, if let's say it's a 35 kilo child, okay? <laughs> when you give uh, 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 oxygen of uh, let's say about four liter per minute of uh, nasal cannula four meter per minute. So if you look at the graph, if you could uh, give a constant flow of four liter per minute, right, the number of pure oxygen that will supply is in this area, okay, in this particular area, whereas the rest of the area will be supplied by uh, the room air, okay, okay. So that's mix up. Just that create a percentage of oxygen, uh, roughly around 30% of uh, uh, oxygen uh, uh, fraction, the, the, the call that fraction in, in, inspire oxygen concentration uh, for, for a bigger child which receiving a four liter per minute of oxygen, okay? But uh, on the other way around, let, let's, say, let's say this child is uh, uh, four kilogram, for example, four kilogram. So you have a four kilogram child. So the peak inspiratory rate flow rate is four, out to four liter. And if you give four liter per minute of oxygen, pure oxygen to this child, so which, so which means the patient will receive 100% oxygen, okay? So that's why in the neonates uh, with three kilogram, if you give them three liter per minute oxygen, you're actually supplying nearly 100% oxygen to them. But for adults like us, so if you give us three liter per minute oxygen, you're going to get about 26 to 28 percent of oxygen. So that is a very important concept why the oxygen varies between adult and also neonate. Although uh, you, you, you are, we are receiving a similar amount of uh, oxygen flow. Okay, so that's why sometimes we, we can observe that uh, in neonate, sometimes you just need a little bit of bubble oxygen for them to maintain the saturation. But once you're off the bubble oxygen, this patient will desaturate. That's because the amount of oxygen, the flow the patient has received. So what makes high flow nasal cannula uh, effective and uh, in terms of uh, giving the ventilation? So this is a normal nasal prong oxygen. So just imagine that if you, if you give a patient with high flow nasal cannula to achieve the peak inspiratory flow rate, for example, it is 35 liter. So if you give a patient with 35 liter per minute of peak inspiratory flow rate, that means you are supporting all the way up, uh, all the way up the, 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 the flow of the patient required. So when, the, when you have already uh, 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 supplied the flow that adequately to achieve the peak inspiratory flow rate, that means the patient do not require to have uh, to, to, to put an effort in order to draw in 35 liter per minute oxygen. And at the same time, you can titrate the oxygen very well, depending on the 
fraction inside oxygen that you have titrate into the system. Okay, so that's the basic concept of high flow nasal cannula. So there's a lot of uh, different type of high flow nasal cannula. You can have opti flow, you can have air wall, and one of the new inventions that quite popular now, I mean in US, I have not come into Malaysia market, which is called high velocity nasal in insufflations, right? So slightly different from this system is that the cannula here, the delivering system is slightly smaller in diameter, and then it's using uh, vapor to heat up and humidify uh, the flow. So they are smaller diameter in terms of the uh, the, the, the the delivering system. So which is very important. So when you talk about smaller diameter, which is uh, same volumetric flow, the volumetric flow, what the volumetric flow means is that number of flow liter per minute oxygen. So if you have a smaller diameter with a similar volume, the velocity tend to be very high. So if you have relatively higher uh, velocity type of flow into uh, the nasal cannula, into the, into the system, in the respiratory system, the gas exchange is going to be much, much faster. So when the gas exchange faster, which means better in terms of ventilation. So when you look at this, when the patient require increasing respiratory support, right? So we started with oxygenation, right? Then after invasive ventilation, then mechanical ventilation. So high flow nasal cannula, ordinary high flow cannula, actually fill out the gap in between, whereby we can have something to play off. Yeah. So whereas we, we, because of this technology, so the uh, the the company actually uh, marketed in this way that so because of the high flow and then leading to improve in terms of uh, ventilation, it could be part of the uh, very good way of uh, non-invasive ventilation as well. So this is the thing to come. So next time, if you have money to buy high flow nasal cannula, you probably can uh, think of uh, vapor them in the future. So how popular is it nowadays? So this is a retrospective study and in, done in 20, published in 2019, looking at how popular is OptiFlow now, or high flow nasal cannula now. So this study actually done uh, over the period of one year in PICU throughout UK, right? They had total emission of 26,000. And out of this 26,000, nearly a quarter of them using high flow nasal cannula. Did that show how popular it is now, right? And Nearly 8% of them who uh, are using uh, high flow nasal cannula in their first admission. Okay? And nearly 5% of them are being used for post extubation support. I have to remember that the failure rate is also relatively high. Nearly a, a quarter of them fail this uh, high flow nasal cannula. A little bit about, now we shift to the CPAP now. So continuous positive airway pressure. So a lot of time when we have a concept of positive airway pressure, this is a, always a graph that in our mind. So that means you create a fixed pressure constantly deliver to the patient. Yeah. So is it true we have only this fixed pressure, but in fact it is not, right? So in fact, although you give us, you set up the machine, on uh, so-called uh, a fixed pressure, right? Okay. The fracture, the pressure is actually fluctuating, uh, depending on how advanced is of the machine. But in fact, the pressure is actually a fluctuating pressure. So later on, when you look at the V60 uh, monitor, then uh, hopefully you can understand what, what does it mean. So this fluctuation pressure might not might or might not give a uh, significant uh, problem uh, uh, when you look at it uh, later on. So with the advancement of technology, because as you could imagine that when you inhale and exhale, so when you inhale, the pressure will drop, okay? When you inhale, the pressure will drop, okay? Because you suck in the air. So how the machine maintain the pressure is by providing the air, right? So when you inhale, the pressure will start to drop, right? Yeah, and then when you exhale, the pressure will start to in increase. So sometimes when this mechanism, because you're against the flow of the, uh, of the machine, so sometimes this one will might create a, a bit discomfort. Patient might feel a bit suffocated, right? So we try to inhale, no problem, very easy and very comfortable. When you start to exhale, you're going to feel resistant because you're trying to against the flow. So with the advanced technology, so people are start to think of a mechanism whereby 
during the exhalation, the machine will sense that the patient is exhaled. So you're going to reduce the pressure during uh, from the CPAP, right? So this is called expiratory pressure release, right? So this is a new technology that uh, later on we can look into uh, in the uh, V60 uh, that, that come with these uh, special features that will increase the comfort of the patient. Right? So this is a CPAP, right? So as you know, CPAP is single pressure, although we know that because of inspiration, expiration will change the pressure, right? The BiPAP or bi-level positive airway pressure, right? So what does it mean, bi-level? Bi-level means two level, right? So you have a expiratory pressure, uh, low level and the high level. When you look at it, this bilateral type of uh, NIV, they have a lot, a lot of different names, okay? Right. So this different, different name basically uh, mean the same thing. You are giving two different pressure. What is low pressure and high pressure? And why does it have a, a lot of different, different name in the market? Basically is that uh, first thing is the, the pattern, right? So certain certain company have a certain specific pattern. Huh? Like for example, you, I'm, I'm sure you heard about SIPAP, right? The SIPAP or uh, synchronized uh, inspiratory positive airway pressure, right? Now, uh, late, late, uh, there was a, a much earlier version, all right? Then lately you had a dual PAP, okay? Uh, which is from the Fabian. All this uh, means the same things, all right? They, they basically uh, providing two different pressure and in terms of assisting ventilation. Why the name are different? Because the companies are different. Right? And then, uh, but uh, it, uh, if you look in, into detail of it, so the basic is that they provide two different pressure, right? So when you provide two different pressure, different companies provide uh, different names, okay? But the principles of uh, Ventilation is more or less the same using these five important uh, different uh, uh, different modes, right? So bi level means two level pressure, but this two level pressure can be controlled differently, okay? And it can be controlled by different different mechanism. So these five different different mechanism uh, can be present in the bi level type of ventilation, so uh, BiPAP or bi-level type of ventilation. So let's let's first look at what uh, each mode is all about. So spontaneous mode, basically spontaneous mode, uh, what it, whatever that you need to set is that pressure support and also the PEP without the rate, right? But some machine do give you a backup rate. So this spontaneous mode, when you want to use a spontaneous mode, the, import, the important prerequisite is that patient must have spontaneous breathing effort, right? So you cannot use it with a patient that frequent apnea, right? Or do not have a, a, a good uh, effort uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to trigger a breathing, right? So this patient must have good respiratory uh, drive in order to go on to using this uh, uh, mode, right? As I say, the, the setup they're going to use is the setting that you're going to put out is a pressure support and also the PEEP. So you don't need to set any I time, you don't need to set the rates, right? But this is only two things that you set, okay? But why spontaneous mode is called a bi level mode? Because it provides two different pressure. The one pressure is pressure support, right? When the patient is able to trigger, and the other one pressure is the PEP. So that's why it's including the bi-level support. Okay. Second is a time mode. A time mode, as you say, as you see, is a time. Time, it means is control, right? So in this is a actual a control mode, right? A control mode, which means you need to set the uh, the the inspiratory pressure. You need to set the expiratory pressure. You need to set the ventilator rate. Okay and then it, you need to set the inspiratory time, okay? The time mode usually are, are quite a crude mode, whereby there's no synchronization, okay? Right. And uh, it is more or less like the secrets that we're using in a, in, a, uh, in some hospital. So it's a secrets ventilator. It's more or less secrets ventilator. Why say a secrets ventilator? Because it's no synchronization, right? It's a fixed mode, whereby it doesn't care whether the patient breathe or not breathe. It's just going to deliver in, in this kind of mode. 
So this mode will be good in the patient that do not have good drive, right? Right, and then uh, this is the type, the mode that you go, right? Mm. And why this is called bilevel? Because yeah, it provides two different pressure. Yeah, okay, so it's a, the B is BT pressure and SPT pressure. The third one, spontaneous and time mode, which is called a ST mode, right? So it's a combination of these two. Right? It's a combination of these two, spontaneous and time, whereby this time mode is basically a backup mode. Just in case the patient do not able to trigger the ventilation, the machine will take over, right? So in the V60 ventilation, they do not have a spontaneous mode. They do not have a T time mode, but they have a ST mode, okay? It's a combination of these two. In fact, it did wonders by combining these two. So you don't need to have these uh, two separate mode actually, okay? So this is a spontaneous time mode, all right? So in the V60, the other mode that you're going to see is that pressure control ventilation. So what does it different between pressure control ventilation and the time mode, right? Similarly, with the time mode, you need to control the IPAP, uh, the inspiratory pressure, SPT pressure, inspiratory time, also the rate. But the things different between the pressure control ventilation and the time mode is that this can be synchronized, okay? If the patient if you set the rate of 20 breaths per minute, but if the patient have breathing of, let's say, uh, more than uh, is 30 breaths per minute, the machine will, will support up to 30 breaths per minute. It's more like, more or less like an assist control mode in the, in the invasive ventilation, right? So whereby the, whatever modes that patient triggered, right, it could be supported by the same setting that you have to uh, uh, ask the machine to, to deliver, okay? All right. So there is a pressure control mode. It is uh, appear uh, in your V60. The other more quite interesting modes uh, uh, that in your V60 is air vaps, all right? What you call uh, average volume assured pressure support, right? Air vaps. It's more or less like a volume control ventilation. Or you could say that it is more like a PRVC mode uh, in a, what do you call that, servo eye ventilator, right? So whereby the machine will try to achieve a certain target of the volume right, that you set in the machine, right? And by titrating the pressure slowly in order to achieve this uh, target volume that you're going to set. So for here, which means you only need to set the rate, need to set the volume, okay? You need to set the, uh, uh, the maximum pressure that you need to deliver. So we're going to see it one by one later on, right? So as a whole, when, and when you talk about bilateral pressure uh, BiPAP, so this is the mode that we are commonly talk about, right? Okay. Yeah. Very importantly is that when you start someone on non-invasive ventilation, you need to be carefully select the patient in order to ensure success, okay? And we're going to look at some of the contraindication or absolute or relative contraindication in the patient, uh, for patient with non-invasive ventilation, okay? And we always have to keep in mind that intubation should be considered in patients who do not show clinical improvement or has signs and symptoms of worsening disease in within few hours of NIV. So do not delay, okay? So you will see the what's the problem if you delay. So this is a very nice uh, study uh, the study basically looking at the, uh, the new definition of PARDS, uh, Pediatric Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome, in 145 PICU throughout 27 countries. It is an observation study, basically want to see whether the PRDS definition can be used uh, as a, 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 a good marker for patients with uh, ARDS in children or not. But in this, in this study, actually, there are 22% of patients who fulfill the criteria of PLDS are started with NIV, right? Out of these 22% of all the patients, nearly half of them require intubation. And you have to remember that after that, within this 50% of patients who require intubation from the NIV, and a lot of them have higher mortality and longer duration 
of uh, ventilation. So that's why it is very important when you put someone on NIV, you can have, especially when the, those are under the PRDS uh, definitions. So you, you need to be very, very careful and then have to be very closely observed. Do not let them drag too long if they clinically do not improve. So we need to intervene them. Okay? Hypoxemia is very strong uh, association. So when a patient that oxygenation do not really improve much, so you after the, you put a patient on NIV, so that's the thing that you need to act on very fast. Okay, All right. This is so-called uh, absolute or maybe relative contraindication in NIV. If you don't put NIV in patient with respiratory arrest, which means uh, patient has respiratory arrest, you need to put some NIV and you need to put some manual bag, right? Then this is not a patient that, uh, that, that require manual bagging to, to, to regain uh, uh, spontaneous breathing. So this, this is a group that we try to avoid uh, in uh, putting them on NIV. And it's a bit different sometimes in a patient like, uh, for example, apnea in uh, acute bronchiolitis in a smaller children. Sometimes we, we still uh, we still try on NIV, all right? So as I said, it is a, a relatively absolute or maybe a relative contraindication. But as a general rule of time, when the patient have respiratory arrest, yeah, uh, try, uh, you have to be very, very careful when you put on the NIV. But as a whole, try not to put in the NIV. Patient with airway compromise, like for example, patient with uh, a few epigotitis, you might not want to put them on NIV because you know that they're going to struggle a lot, right? But bear in mind that sometimes, for, for example, patient with uh, laryngeal malaysia, right, uh, who also have some airway compromisation. So in this that group, usually sometimes we can try on a patient uh, on NIV as well. So as I, it is probably a, a, a relative contraindication, but always always have to bear in mind that this is. Uh, some contraindication do, uh, the, do uh, have to be considered. Huh? Neurological illness, especially when patient with uh, traumatic brain injury or patient have uh, unable to maintain uh, the saliva, huh? excessive salivations. Those group of patients have very high incidence of aspiration. So try to avoid that. Patient with multi-organ failure have very, very, very high NIV uh, uh, failure rate. Patient with severe septic shock, right? So yeah, uh, had to be avoid in, in NIV. Yeah, facial trauma based on skull fracture. You know that uh, this is quite a dangerous thing to do. Huh? So sometimes the air might go into the base of the skull. Yeah. So and then the facial trauma then can cause some injury to the face some more. Right? You need to strap down the face. Untreated pneumothorax. Yeah, uh, had to be very careful. Yeah, because. Sometimes this uh, the flow might be gain when the go into the patient might be very high, especially when the when the mask let go for a while and then reapply again, you, you will feel that some gush of air going to the lung. So this gush of air sometimes can worsen the pneumothorax because it contribute a significant high inspiratory pressure, right? Okay, now we're going to divide this uh, uh, into uh, neonatal NIV and uh, pediatric NIV because it's very important that uh, we need to look at what's the main difference between the neonatal NIV and uh, uh, pediatric NIV. And as you know that this is a very nice uh, bubble CPAP, which is a, a neonatal NIV, right? So the pressure are depending on the, how deep the, the, the pujong of the tube go into the water, right? Give you how much of centimeter water, right? So a lot of time, uh, people do different different things. Try to mimic all these bottles. Okay, we have sometime long ago we used to use chest tube bottle, the glass chest tube bottle, to modify it. Yeah. And CyPAP, CyPAP is a, one of the uh, machine that I like uh, to use. Yeah. Until now, I mean, it's a, I, I, I feel that this is one of the best machine, NIV. Uh, uh, for for pediatrics, uh, for so for neonate, right? So CyPAP, as I mentioned earlier on, because of the company, uh, the the patent company, it's actually a BiPAP, right? But because the company need to use other names, uh, so the, the, the patent is their name. So it's a it's synchronized inspiratory positive pressure. So this machine basically give you can be give CPAP and BiPAP, right? So they are actually flow driven. Okay, it's a flow driven. So 
you are, you are adjusting the, the pressure using the flow, right? Which means that the, 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 it's very, very manual dependent. It's not so automatic, right? So you just control the flow and then the machine just measure whatever the pressure that generated uh, from the machine. And you have very, very nice different uh, setup setting, right? Okay, you can give CPAP. CPAP with apnea, I mean, it can detect uh, apnea on the patient because there is a small apnea monitor on the patient chest wall, right? Which it can detect the respiratory rate and also function as a trigger. Okay, and you have a biphasic trigger, right? Whereby, uh, yeah, you can set a certain rate and then if the patient has spontaneous breathing, it's also going, going to be triggered the breath, right? So here you look at it very carefully. This is a biphasic trigger, right? And look carefully at the inspiratory time. This inspiratory time is 0.3, which is suit to the uh, normal inspiratory time for the neonate, right? The neonatal inspiratory time, right? In terms of the, each breath, right? So that means this machine is going to support the breath, okay? The other thing different setting now here is that huh, this is a biphasic. This biphasic basically, you will look at the eye time is one second. So this is more or less like a recruitment strategy, right? So this compared to the 0.3, this is a one second. So it means you're giving a dual level inspiratory pressure, right? So with this one second, you hope that you can recruit the lung uh, much better. This is another board called biphasic with apnea, whereby if the patient, uh, the, uh, the machine will detect uh, a patient have apnea, then you're going to have a supportive breath, right? So this is a supportive breath that the patient uh, uh, going to have, okay? So that is in terms of side pep. And now uh, I think a few of the hospitals will have this kind of machine called dual pep, right? Dual pep is slightly more advanced than the side pep. As we discussed earlier on side pep, that means you control the flow and then the machine measure the pressure. Whereas side pep, you are the one that control the pressure and then the machine will deliver the flow, vary the flow accordingly, right? Change the flow accordingly in order to achieve your pressure, okay? Very important uh, in this uh, uh, neonatal NIV is that this neonatal non-invasive ventilator, they have flow limit, okay? The, the maximum flow that the machine going to deliver by dual pack is around 20 to 25 liter per minute. So that is a maximum flow rate, okay? As compared to the side pack, as you could see here, this panel, the maximum inspiratory flow rate here is only about 15 liter per minute, okay? So that's why it is used in a, it is used in a neonate because the neonate, with the limitation of the inspiratory flow, it is much safer, right? You do not go very, very high in CPT flow. That can cause a pneumothorax in, in, in children, in, in, in neonate, right? Okay. As compared to V60, one has to be very, very careful, especially when you we, we try to use the V60 uh, NIV in a small infant or in, a, in even in a neonate, all right? Although sometimes we, we do it uh, in a neonate or a small infant using this uh, out of the... Uh, so what what do you call that? Uh, um, although not recommended by the 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 what do you call that the the industry the, the factory yeah. So the maximum inspiratory flow rate from the V60 can go up to 150 liter per minute right. So that high flow right. So that is a that, that you, you could compare that 25 liter as compared to 150 liter. So this 150 liters sometimes can cause problem because especially when you have a leak mass that sudden, suddenly become non-leak already. Huh? So switching from the excessive leak to a non-leak, so the, the the machine will not will has will need to have some time to adjust their flow. So when this happens, you're going to create a big gush of air into the lung. So that will going to cause a lot of lung damage and also pneumothorax if 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 if, if it is in problem. Yeah. So similarly, this dual pep is uh, the company name, okay? So what it, it, it deliver is two pressure. And I have to remember that most of the dual pad, Fabian dual pad uh, that we have uh, are so-called a time mode, right? They are time mode, which means they're non-synchronized at all, right? Okay, 
So it can use it as as we as we uh, discussed earlier in this biphasic mode or side effect. It can be like a time mode that you put for the recruitment strategy, whereby you put the one second or time mode in a patient with very very bad apnea that you can want to put it in the fixed rate, but with the certain fixed insipidity time, which is much lower as compared to the recruitment one. If you are rich enough, sometimes there are sensor actually. So this is a sensor that can, you can put at the door pad in order to synchronize the breathing, right? To, to make the machine is more friendly, especially in the neonate. So just now we talk about neonatal non-invasive. The important thing is that neonatal non-invasive ventilator, they are actually their maximum flow are limited to 20 to 25. Whereas pediatric non-invasive ventilator, our flow is very, very high, 150 liters per minute. That could create a lot of problem, huh? in, especially in a small children. Huh? So especially when, when you talk about using this machine in a smaller children, in a smaller infant or neonate, so need to be a, a special care, need to be uh, uh, pay attention to. Yeah, okay. And uh, as a company uh, recommended, for respironic V60 is up to 20 kilo. Huh? So, um, but then as I say, uh, you can use it uh, uh, in smaller children with, with a care, yeah. So if you do not have a NIV, which, what, what do you do, right? <laughs> and especially on a, a simple CPAP, what do you do if you do not have an NIV? Would you just give up like that? <coughs> please, please don't give up, huh? okay. So we can actually do NIV in the in a specific manner, right? So this is a very nice uh, uh, paper from India, right? Published in the pediatric Indian Journal of Critical Care Medicine, whereby they use an anesthetic uh, uh, bag, or, or we call it a flow infecting bag, to create a CPAP for patients. Okay, and what they do is that they're using this uh, Jackson V's and a uh, Bain circuit. So Jackson V's meaning for a small children, right? Because the bag are smaller, which is about five liter, uh, uh, 500 mil. And then uh, a bigger patients, about one liter, one to, one to, one to, one to, one to five liter type bag, right? It's very simple. Uh, you just put in oxygen flow, okay? And then create, you control the flow out from the machine and then create a pressure. Similarly here, right? So way to get this, sometimes your anesthetic, uh, I'm sure that each hospital have their OT. So they all three have this kind of uh, uh, the anesthetic circuit that you can make to use of. So you need to be uh, like a MacGyver. Uh -huh. So try to use a special way to, to, to do it. This is what, what people do, right? So the mother are asked to hold, right? To hold the, the, the mask to the child, right? Similarly here, you know, the mother are instruct to hold the ventilation, right? Okay. And uh, quite surprised, yeah? You see, you see that when you look at the monitor, wow, they are using Maximo, man. Oh, very expensive type of <laughs> uh, machine. You see the ventilator they use? Servo U, man. Uh, not too bad also, huh? uh, although they say that they are poor country, but they do have a lot of uh, nice machine. Huh? So what's the outcome? You look at the outcome. Yeah, so in mucolitis, pneumonia definitely because they have good outcome because uh, single lung pathology, right? Single single organ pathology, right? Okay, but I have to be very careful as this uh, as this their study also show that right. If you have patient with septic shock, okay, right? Any type of patient, uh, where is be it be it using the MacGyver technique, be it uh, NIV techniques, all right? Uh, our modern NIV, when the patient has septic shock, you need to be very, very careful because the failure rate of a non-invasive is very high. Okay, all right. And uh, this is just to illustrate again, all right? Patient with uh, shock, right? NIV failure is high. Patient without shock, NIV failure is relatively okay. Right? So that is an important things that I need to uh, put, uh, uh, to remind you all. So patient that uh, uh, putting on NIV have to be very careful, especially when they are in shock. Okay. In order to ensure uh, 
the uh, the, the success of your NIV beside knowing that underlying condition of the patient. The interface is also one of the very important factor that you need to look into it. Because as you know, patient will struggle. You want to put something onto the face of the patient, and so there will be a lot of struggle, especially those the toddler age group, right? So you're going to have a lot of struggle. For bigger child as well, sometimes there's a lot of struggle as well because they, 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 they just don't, don't like it. If you could experience yourself, put yourself on a CPAP mask, but it's, it's not a nice feeling at all. Right? So in a bigger child, a lot of time, talk through is very important. right? You need to let the patient understand what are you going to bring him into. right? So what, what I usually talk to my patient is that those that are able to understand one, so just let them imagine first. Let them imagine the common question that I usually I ask them. Have you ride a motorbike before? Right? So most of them in our population, most of them uh, experience motorbike before. Or have you experienced riding the car with the open window? Okay. Right. So this is the, the, the experience that I am going to need, I'm going to illustrate to them. So you're going to have like uh, things that put into your nose, like you're going to ride uh, in the motorbike. And that kind of feeling. Okay. Or sometimes I'll I'll persuade them by saying that, okay. Uh, have you, do you dream of become a pilot, right? So do you see that the, the pilot using, uh, 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 especially the jet fighter pilot, they're using a special mask that put in their face, okay? Do you want to experience that or similar experience like the pilot did, right? So these are things that uh, sometimes you, you need to let them know, get their confidence, okay? Letting them know that uh, this is... Um, a thing that you will take time for you to accommodate. So these are very important tricks that one uh, had to be uh, uh, taught to them. Yeah. Okay. Besides that, it's also uh, yeah. We'll talk about it later. Huh? So so it's very important. Uh, you, you need to know uh, what are the variety of the masks that you have uh, for the patient. In fact, sometimes when you initiate uh, NIV in patient, sometimes in one single patient we can change out to two or three masks or two or three different interface in order to make this success. Okay, so this is a nasal mask. This is a full face mask. Okay, so this is a very nice nasal mask. It's called Respirio and this is Mask Medic. Okay, and if you compare this mask and compare this phone, right? This is uh, Nokia uh, 3310. Huh? Right. So this mask is uh, more or like, less uh, 800. This is 100. Okay, so about eight times higher, <laughs> but this eight hundred was the old price. Now a day is about one thousand something. Huh? So it will be a one point one point two. <laughs> yeah, yeah, one point uh, what, what, twelve times much more expensive, right? Okay, this mask costs about nine hundred. Okay, why they are expensive because uh, they are silicone based. Okay, very importantly, if you see that when a patient with an NIV mask, they always have a leak. Huh? They always have a leak uh, hole. Huh? He also have a leak hole. The purpose of the leak hole is that allow uh, allow SPG gas to go up, right? Okay. Yeah. The another nasal mask, okay. Different different type of nasal mask, okay. They need to try. Huh? This is a oral nasal mask, okay. Oral nasal mask, and uh, lastly a full face mask. Okay. Full face mask is very useful, especially for patient, a smaller patient, okay, because that it, it doesn't affect their vision much. And so there's less fear, right? But the point is that sometimes when there's a lot of humidification, then you could see that or like a rainy pattern, and then they couldn't see uh, clearly at all after that. Yeah. So know what mask that you have is very important huh, to ensure the success of the NIV. This is another uh, 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 way of uh, doing NIV. I do not have this. I only have one experience when I was in UK when the one child was put on this hood, right? Very nice is because uh, yeah, there's no nothing strapped on the head of the patient. It did, but they, the, the thing is that they need to strap on the axilla, which is sometimes might not be that comfortable. Okay, As you could see that um, during the early phase of the COVID-19, so this hood has been widely used in uh, Italy right, and the Spanish group. The reason why they use this uh, in Italy is Spanish group because the exhalation gas can be controlled. right. So this exhalation gas there is usually has a port here, right? So the pressure gauge port, right? So this pressure gauge port sometimes 
we can put a HEPA filter here, right? So we do the so the air from the patient is not directly go out, but it can go through the filter. So that makes the environment much safer. Okay, all right. So that's all about in terms of the mask the, in the interface. Now let's look into the ventilator circuit. It's very important. One has to understand the circuits different, all right? So most of the dedicated NIV, they are all single limb, right? What do we mean by single limb is that there's only one gas source come up from the machine, okay? And then it delivers to the patient, okay? So this is what we call a dedicated uh, NIV machine. Most of the dedicated NIV machines use single limb. Whereas some of the ventilator, that invasive ventilator that we have, they have also come with a function of non-invasive ventilator. But what's a major difference is that this kind of invasive, uh, so-called the hybrid type of uh, ventilator, which can do invasive and non-invasive, they usually come with double limb. Okay? They come with double limb, okay? which means the inhalation gas has to go to the patient and then exhalation gas go back to the machine again. Okay? So there are two important differences in this, in this manner. Okay? So in a single limb ventilation, NIV is usually much better than the double limb. Why I say so is that because in single limb ventilations, single limb type of uh, dedicated NIV, they usually use high flow, right? As you understand that in terms of ventilation, the thing that involved in ventilation is in, uh, uh, flow is a very important factor. So if you can have very high flow, uh, type of ventilations, right? Especially non-invasive ventilation. Usually, the ventilation is better than a relatively low flow from the double limb. Okay. The gas come out from the invasive uh, ventilator. Usually, the flow are relatively not as good or not as fast as a single limb. So that's why that make it less powerful as compared to the single limb. Okay. And also in double limb wise, because of the limitation of flow, okay, so they could not compensate leak very well as compared to the single limb. Because single limb, they are very high flow. They can compensate leak much, much better as compared to the double limb. So in a double limb, usually you need to have a fixed non-leak uh, type of mask, whereby the mask should not have any leak at all. Right, so it need to be very tightly sealed to the patient's uh, face in order to generate a pressure. Whereas a single limb uh, type of a uh, machine, right? So they allow significant leak, and then the machine will be very good in compensating the leak. Yeah. So this is one of the example, okay, uh, for the patient on a single limb NIV, which is a V60. As compared to, this is one of the patients, one of the patients on COVID <laughs> that uh, I mean in Cebu Hospital. Yeah, they are using the invasive ventilator uh, type of uh, NIV, right? Okay. So you see that there's a, a full limb and also there's a non leak mask there. Okay. Both can function as effectively, but for the patient at very bad luck, they require more support, right? Single limb type of NIV support usually are to be relatively better. So let's now talk about the limb, uh, the, 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 the connect, the circuits. Then come about the non-invasive ventilator itself, okay? So basically they are divided into two. One we call a clinical NIV, clinical setting of NIV and non-clinical NIV. I'm sure that a lot of us before having the PCB sexy, we use quite a lot of this kind of uh, home-based NIV non-clinical uh, non-clinical NIV machine as compared to this clinical machine. What's the major difference between these two? The clinical NIV machine is usually the uh, the the oxygen source is usually from the uh, from the wall huh? Huh? from the high pressure oxygen source. So that's why you can titrate the FiO two very well. Okay, you can titrate it very accurately. Whereas non-clinical uh, NIV machine, basically they are they use for home base, right? They are not supposed to use <laughs> at, at the hospital bed sites. 
uh, for patients, but then we use it is mainly designed to use at home, right? Whereby they are not supposed to give oxygen, but if you give oxygen into this system, usually they are quite limited, right? You can only giving uh, uh, oxygen flow about three to up to maximum five liter per minute because most of the oxygen concentrator can could only support up to five liter per minute type of uh, oxygen, right? So this is a, one of the important difference, okay? The clinical and non-clinical. Secondly, is the machine, the turbine, right? So clinical NIV machine, they have a very powerful turbine, right? The, the turbine is so powerful that it can be constantly used without stopping, right? Okay. Whereas a non-clinical uh, type of uh, machine, yeah, it is not meant for continuously use, right? Although no doubt, sometimes we send patient home, which is called continuous use, but they are designed not for continuously use. You you find out problem is whenever there's the patient have a lot of significant leak, right? So the patient or NIV has significant leak. Sometimes you notice, hey, machine to talk by itself, huh? you switch off by itself because in order to maintain to protect the machine from overheating, so there is a significant leak for a very long period of time. The machine will just shut down by itself. So this pose a big danger in the patients. <laughs> Uh, they are, yeah, they are, we had just incidents uh, last month in, in, in my ward, uh, whereby the patient on NIV and then causing significant leak and then we turn, turn sinus and needing re, needing reintubation in PICU. So this is a uh, important thing that you need to bear in mind. Huh? So this type of machine, home-based machine, is not for clinical use, although sometimes, I mean, we, we use it clinically, yeah. And then the the that, uh, the, the difference between the uh, power, huh? the oxygen and both the power, right? Then come to our main topic today. <laughs> Non-stop then I eventually come to the main topic. How are you going to use the V60, right? So for V60, uh, this is the dato. Uh, we call it a dato, vision by PEP. It's the old generation of the Philip V60, right? It's a very useful type of ventilation. Okay. Importantly is that uh, we need to understand the circuits, right? Okay. Just now we talk about single limb. No doubt, NIV have single limb circuit, right? But the single limb circuit, they can divide it into dry circuit and as well as a humidified circuit, right? So this system, a lot of time in adult, they're using dry circuit. What do you mean by dry circuit? Is that there's no humidification system in the machine itself, right? So the whole thing, the gas will come out from the machine without humidify and directly go to the patient mask. Okay, here, right. So which means the patient will go to receive cold air, right? Cold and dry air, which is something um, uh, might be quite uh, going to be a significant problem in uh, children, pediatric, and not so much in terms of the adult, although I suppose that they have significant problem as well. And you see that sometimes they might put a, a HME here. Huh? They might put a green color HME here, right? But this HME might not give any benefit of what it's supposed to do as compared to the intubation HME, right? So for a patient with intubated in a dry circuit that they commonly do, they put a HME, that is true because the ETT tube is down into the lung, and then the air will in and out into the same circuit. But then if you put the HME here, the air will go in through here from the patient, and then you're going to leak out from the side, okay, or the, from the hole, right? So it doesn't go back to the machine that much, right? Okay, so that's why it doesn't create a humidified. It didn't give you any humidified or, or, or heat exchange at all, right? What it does is basically, make the air more clean, uh, go through the filter uh, in this kind of system, right? Right. So this is a dry system. Whereas uh, we try to use the humidified uh, uh, circuits, right? The humid circuits here, you could be uh, uh, the, the humid circuit with the heated wire or without the, without the heated wire inside the tubing, right? The Cebu one here, yeah, you have the heated chamber but without the heated wire that also can be done I, I i used to use that as well yeah but eventually find out that it also not adequate in patients that require uh, niv especially in smaller one 
So that's why we change to a, we modified it into a, a, a circuit with heated wire, right? Okay. So the, 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 the good thing about humidified circuit is that a lot of time previously before we start to use the humidified circuit is that uh, we, we, did, we did dry circuit, patients tend to develop plug around the oral fairing area. This plug sometimes can be big enough to cause airway obstruction. We have previously few patients uh, that on NIV then was really well, but then subsequently a few days down the line needing reincubation. During the reincubation process, we actually suck up huge uh, plug that obstructed the airway yeah, uh, in this patient. So that's why when times go by, we will try, we, we, we actually uh, prefer and then modify into this uh, humidified circuit. Yeah. So this is how the circuit look like in the term of humidification. Right? So you have this uh, gas come out from the system, right? the, the gas will go into the humidified chamber, all right, okay, come out from the humidified chamber. And this very important tubing here is the pressure monitor port, right? This pressure monitor port subsequently will connect to uh, uh, another port in very near the patient later on, I'll show you, yeah. So this come to the chamber, the chamber, unified chamber, all right? And this is a heated wire that we modified from our uh, invasive ventilator tubing. So the, the heating wire is supposed to connect it into the uh, unified tubing, uh, the, 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 the heated tubing, okay? And then come up, connect to the patient, and uh, connect right up to the patient. Remember just now the, the port, the pressure port here? So you actually measure the pressure around here, okay, around here, that connected back to here, right? So if this, this tubing is not connected, right, so the, you're not going to have any pressure monitor, pressure monitor here in the ventilator setup, right? in, the, in the screen, okay, all right? So that's all about in terms of the in terms of the setup of the machine, okay? All right. No doubt in, in, in Cebu, you all do not have uh, this uh, humidifies, uh, what they call that, heated wire tubing, but uh, the heated chamber is, uh, yeah, it, is, uh, it can be, uh, it, it, it sometimes will be uh, uh, sufficient, right? But uh, main thing that there are certain tricks that we, we, we can look into later on, uh, we'll discuss when you go along, yeah? Okay, right. Now let, let's come to the machine proper. Yeah? So this is the machine main screen, right? So let's study the screen first, okay? So from the, from the top to the bottom. So this is the top part of the screen here, all right? So there's a alarm silence, alarm reset, and then this is what we call the alarm, uh, what do you call it? The alarm uh, information that you have here. And over the right corner here, there is also a just button. You see that uh, there's a circle thing, and then in the middle there's a tick, right? So this is the the the, the one the is is actually a knob for you to adjust the setting later on, okay? And come to this screen. This is a monitor screen, numeric monitor screen. What does each of them mean, right? So this is actually detect whether the patient is exhale or inhale, or sometimes there's a time, okay? It just monitors what the patient is doing, right? So the, if the patient has spontaneous blue, uh, respiration, okay, like spontaneous, uh, this is light blue, right? So there will be spontaneous respiration that detected by the machine, okay? Exhale, acceleration. And then the orange color one, which is quite similar like this, is a time whereby the machine will deliver the breath, okay? So this is the respiratory rate that monitored by the machine, okay? This is the estimated tidal volume, Okay. This is the estimated measured uh, minute expiratory volume. Uh, this is a minute expiratory volume. Okay, this is a peak inspiratory pressure uh, monitor. Okay, this is the total leak, uh, the leak that come up from the system. It is a total leak. There are two leaks can be measured later. I'm going to talk about it. Uh, one is we call a total leak as shown in the pictures. Okay, and there's another one called patient leak. Okay, the leak is important. Why the leak is important? It, it, it shows that uh, uh, they, 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 uh, there's significant leak. So when there's a leak, so the, the delivery or uh, the, the machine, although will try to compensate as much as possible to overcome the leak in order to achieve your pressure, 
but you don't want your machine to work too hard as well, right? So if your machine working too hard, try to blow in whatever gas into the system, then uh, the lifespan of the machine uh, will be lower. Huh? So try as much as possible, try to reduce the leak. Huh? How much the leak is acceptable? I mean, usually we took it about uh, anything less than 50, I'm, I'm still uh, is happy. But if you could get anything less than 30, that would be fantastic. But uh, sometimes it's quite difficult. Sometimes it's quite difficult, especially in terms of the total leak itself. The reason of totally we're going to talk about it later. So if you leak too much as well, if you if you, if you look, have to be very careful in terms of leak. So if the system have leaked too much, you're going to notice that the humidification will be a problem if you do not use the uh, uh, the heated wire chamber type. Because if you have too much of leak, right? So that means the flow is very high. So if your flow is very high, if the chamber pressure do not increase, right, the air they're going to deliver to patient is going to be very dry and cold. Okay, so this is what the important things that you need to look into, right? So if you leak too much, the air the patient receive is going to be dry and cold. Okay, right, if, especially when you use the only the heater chamber without the the what do you call that a uh, heating wire to monitor the this thing to monitor the the, the humidification yeah patient trigger it just show you that how much effort the patient is doing right so if it is 100 percent that means the patient does all the breathing by itself by herself or by him or herself right so they mean 100 percent patient trigger that mean very good huh? the patient is ready to take up the win i mean ready ready to win huh? okay especially in terms of the rate right this is TI versus uh, over T thoughts, right? This is basically inspiratory time versus total uh, respiratory uh, time, okay? Inspiratory time over the respiratory circuit, the time for the, the whole inspiration and expiration, right? If this is 30%, okay? Which means is that the inspiratory time is 30% out of total, which means it is with the uh, IE ratio of one to two type of manner, okay? So it is just to monitor how the patient's breathing, right? So this patient is breathing very well, okay? In fact, it gives you an IE ratio of one to two, which is shown by the inspiratory time versus the total uh, respiratory time, okay? 30%, right? So you have the panel here, the panel here which monitor the pressure, the flow, Okay, and then the inspiratory volume. Okay, the panel here you can pause and then try to monitor. You can increase the size, okay, by varying the size, or you can increase the time or reduce the time. How fast that the machine going to go? All right. Okay. And this column, if you have alarm, okay, the machine will come up in this alarm. Always, always look into the alarm. See what's happened. Okay, because we we have incidents whereby when we thought that, oh, patients fail NIV, right? Patient and fail NIV. Although the patient look very comfortable, except unable to maintain saturation, 70 something to 80 something, right? But then we put a FIO2 a very high, you know? FIO2 put 100%, right? And then we try to uh, put the patient NIV, but the patient saturation do not improve. Right? And then we, we're about to decide I huh? want to decide to intubate the patient only because patient do not not able to maintain saturation, but we forgot to look at the alarm. The alarm uh, say that oh, oxygen not connected. <laughs> Basically, the oxygen are not connected huh, into the system. So it's very careful. Always look at the alarm, right? Don't ignore the alarm, especially the uh, oxygen alarm. Huh? So we tell you because sometimes we were too too uh, uh, excited, <laughs> too kanjong, huh? We forgot to put in the oxygen, or sometimes the oxygen connection might be loose, right? You need, you didn't notice that the might not plug in properly, and you try to uh, put NIV in the patient, giving hundred percent oxygen, but in fact you are not delivering hundred percent oxygen. Huh? So that's a very important thing that you always have to look into, right? Come to this panel here. This panel here actually showing what is the mode that you have, right? So your CPAP mode, okay, the active mode at the moment, okay, and this machine. And yours machine in Cebu also have auto track, okay? But the Sadike machine, the adult one, do not have this feature called auto track, right? 
uh, they, they have auto track, but then do not have auto track plus. Okay. What this auto track mean is that this auto track is actually a tracking machine or a trigger machine, right? In adult set, you have auto track alone, right? Because the machine is basically designed for a uh, uh, adult, right? So the 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 trigger are very much uh, geared towards adult, right? Whereas in pediatric, we we'll prefer if you buy the machine next time you put on the auto track plus. The auto track plus here means that you can adjust the trigger. Okay, you can adjust the trigger to become very very sensitive, so that when the patients are uh, put on the bypass settings, the machine can sense can be triggered by the patient respiratory effort. Okay. Bear in mind that this machine is designed for 20 kilo, right? So in, in order to make it more sensitive, the machine become more sensitive, this is a very important feature, auto track plus, that you want have to be very put attention to, right? Come to this uh, panel. This panel is actually your adjustment, okay? Your adjustment, we're going to uh, go one by one later on, okay? And lastly, at the bottom, you have a few panel here. So the first panel show you the setting, all right? Second is alarm, third is a mode, fourth is menu, and the standby. So we go one by one from that, yeah? So this is a full screen of what you could see. If you're able to reset all the alarm, always put the habit of seeing this type of screen rather than the earlier screen. The earlier screen always had alarm. That means you need to do something. Don't let the alarm continue to be there, right? So when the alarm's there, that means you need to adjust. You need to do something to make sure that the patient is safe on the machine. So this is a nice, uh, this is what you have to see most of the time, okay? Uh, this kind of uh, uh, monitor. Hmm? So now let's go to one by one, what's the lower button uh, mean? So alarm, basically, when you, when you, this is a touch screen, when you press here, it's going to show you the alarm that you can set, right? The high rate, the low rate, High tidal volume, low tidal volume, high inspiratory pressure, low inspiratory pressure, okay, right? The, in, the, the inspiratory time, all right? And then also the low inspiratory time, uh, the low inspiratory volume, uh, minute volume, okay? Then you come to the modes, all right? So in this machine, there are four modes as we discussed earlier. CPAP, ST, pressure control ventilation, and AVAPS, okay? What does batch mean, okay? So this batch mean basically means that you are at the moment is in this active mode, okay? When you have batch, that means you can change a lot of uh, setting at one go, right? Okay, so that, that's what batch means. It, it doesn't really mat, uh, means anything. It's just that you are at the moment at this active mode, okay? and then you can make a lot of changes in this mode, right? That, that's what that, it does mean, yeah? Okay, after that, you go to this menu, right? So when you have this menu, you're going to see a few buttons here. So for adult machine, right? They do not have this button called Auto Track Plus, okay? But uh, in uh, the the Sadiqe probably do not have this, right? So the Cebu one, they have this Auto Track Plus, okay? So you can adjust brightness, loudness of the machine. You can have some information of the uh, ventilator. You can screen lock so that your staff will not catch out. So the the two important thing that you're going to look into it is this the mask pop and also the Auto Track, right? So let's go to the mask and pop first. So before you use the machine, you must let the machine know what type of mask that you're using, what type of port that you're using, okay? Because this is very important in terms of total calculation of the leak, right? You need to ensure how much leak that you are, you are, you are calculating because the leak, as I said earlier on, will, will, will make your, if, if as lower leak as possible, will make your machine last longer because the machine will not work too hard. And also, it's very important in terms of humidification, right? So if a low leak system, the humidification it will be better as compared to a high leak system. Yeah. So if you press on the uh, from this menu, you press on the button of mask. So you're going to see this, right? First, you're going to ask you what other masks that you want to select. Okay, right. So you can have others. Okay, look at the button. You can have others, or you can have this very a different mask symbol, or you can have tracky, all right? So the others is basically for, because the Respironic or the Philip, Philip uh, machine by itself, 
it come with a different, 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 different mask. Okay, so you could see that you have one over one, one over two, one over three, one over four type of different, different masks. This different, different masks in respironic, uh, uh, respironic, uh, the codec mask, usually they will write down on the arm here. Okay, see, that is one, two, one, two. So when you select which one, then you just go to which one and then press accept. Okay, it's important because there's already calculated a uh, fixed amount of leak from this system. Okay, so if you able to calculate the leak amount, the machine, the subject, uh, to, to, to tell the machine actually you are using this specific type of mask, the leak going to uh, calculate is going to be a patient leak, it's no longer a total leak. Okay, if we use this this mask, like for example, this mask, it is not a, a Philip Respironic mask. Okay, all right. Uh, so you're going to put others. Okay, put the thing others. So importantly, what does it change? It actually measure the total leak. Right, whatever the machine come up, it actually a total leak. Okay, I hope that you understand this. Yeah. Okay. Please stop me if you think that uh, uh, I'm a bit too fast or I'm, I'm a bit uh, make you more confused. <laughs> okay. Right. Huh? So this is the important thing. Okay. After you put, after you press the accept. Okay. After you accept it, I mean you have already decide what type of mask that you want to use. Then the system will ask you what type of acceleration valve that you're using. Okay. These are the few different acceleration valve that uh, come in the system all right similarly this acceleration valve is to ensure the patient can excel properly right okay no doubt just now as we say the early on this leak will allow the patient to excel as compared to the double link one is no leak mask right? so this leak is very important try not to occlude it okay sometimes the nurses feel that oh there's a lot of air come here uh there may be a leak here they go and plaster it so it's very dangerous if you plaster it they mean the, the calculation will be very much affected. The patient might not be able to breathe properly, right? So um, when we first start NIV, some of my nurses feel that the gas, the flow is too high. Sometimes the child don't like it. So they just occlude it using a plaster. So it should not be, huh? you, you, you should not do that. Huh? So it's very dangerous. The patient might not be able to exhale the gas, right? Okay. And then similarly, this is a different type of exhalation valve, okay? So you have to choose what type of acceleration valve that you want to you, you are using. Huh? Whether it's a, a whisper, the, the whisper swivel, this is a whisper swivel, okay? All right. Or the disposable acceleration port. In fact, I think most of us are using this. Okay, later I'll show you what does it mean. It is similar with this one, okay? The disposable acceleration port. And we do not have this PEB, right? Uh, the, the, the flat one, okay? This is what I call a PEB, a PEB valve, okay? okay. So by default, I think all of us will use this one, okay, right? Or if you have a whisper swivel, again, you can press this one, okay? Mm -hmm. So this is what we mean that uh, our, our port, right? This is the, what do you call that? Uh, the respironic disposable acceleration port, okay? So this is a port, yeah. So this is a, uh, one of the very important thing that we recycle, right? Because uh, in order, sometimes we want to uh, cut costs, um, this is the thing that very important. Uh, we can wash because uh, this is very important measuring pressure. You remember just now when we talk about the pressure monitor. This is the thing that we need to put into the machine. Go ahead to uh, measure the pressure, right? Always remember that there's always an opening here where the gas will escape. This is for the exhalation, right? So there's a lot of gas come out here. So uh, and it's the, the main thing is that it's for exhalation. This should not be occluded, right? This should not be occluded, right? Although sometimes the nurses say that, oh, there's a leak here, let's occlude it. No, please don't. Huh? Okay. So this is not for, uh, this is not a leak. Um, yeah, it is a leak, but the, a leak with a purpose for exhalation. Yeah. Mm. Then come to, after after you set up this one, then you can put on the auto tracks. No? So these auto tracks, they are basically, when you press on the auto track, they actually have two different, two different things that you can adjust, okay? So when you press, the, the as I say, this is a trigger trigger sensitivity, all right? So you press on the trigger, there will be a different trigger here that as you show, right? So whether you want to put a normal trigger 
that usually the auto track one, right? Uh, uh, without the plus, right? Or you put it more sensitive, okay? You put it a plus seven. Plus seven is very, very sensitive. A lot of time, uh, we will put uh, a plus seven. By default, most of the time, I put all the patient on plus seven, especially in the smaller children. Uh, might be different if a patient with a bigger child or total, uh, what they call that bigger patient, all right? For, for those that are near adult, yeah? So you can put it as normal. Huh? So after that, you press the button accept, then the machine will be more sensitive and then they can trigger the breath better. Huh? Then the other thing that you can uh, control is the exhalation cycle. I mean, when you want the the in the the in inspiration to terminate. Okay, so when you press the, the E cycle, the exhalation cycle, this is what you're going to see, right? Whether you want to terminate the flow as normal. Okay, most of the time we put it as a default. Okay, uh, normal exhalation. Okay, or you can make it uh, more sensitive. That means the getting the, the termination is much much faster, okay, whereby the inspiratory time become very short, okay, or you can make it less sensitive, whereby you have more inspiratory time, no? so this is the thing that you can adjust, but most of the time, I will put it at the default of as normal, yeah. Okay, so all, the, all these are the, uh, 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 what do you call that, uh, 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 basic setup before you put on the patient, okay. Now let's come to... Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is a CPAP machine, okay, or the CPAP setup, right? Most of the time, when the patient come to PICU, uh, despite how distressed they are, the first initial setting that I'm going to set is still CPAP. Okay? As I say, in order to gain the confidence of the patient, in order to let the patient accommodate well uh, to the system and also to ensure the patient comfortable with it, you have to always start on a very low pressure, which is a CPAP. And from the CPAP, most of the time, I will start on very, very low uh, CPAP pressure as well. So because the machine lowest pressure it can go is four, right? So when I put on the patient, after I gain their confidence, I, I give them a pressure of four, but I give them 100% oxygen. This is what I usually do. Put on 100% oxygen, low pressure, right? So when the patient uh, do not look at the situation, yeah, and sometimes you will be very scared, and then you tend to tend to uh, escalate the, the, the setting very fast. Main thing, the first thing is to gain the confidence of the patient, and then let them feel comfortable. Uh, CPAP of four, F out to hundred percent. Okay, so when they start to become more comfortable already, they can slowly push out the push out the uh, CPAP, right? For the uh, five, six seven eight okay all right so take out kind of CPAP pressure okay so when you have quite comfortable the patient on the CPAP pressure then what is the next thing you want to do because you want to put the, the patient look distressed you want to put on the bipap so you can next thing that you want to do is that you set up the bipap setting but try as much as possible do not let the delta p or the the difference between the high pressure and low pressure too much usually i will start with the different pressure only one which means I will start on IPAP of 7, EPAP of 6, okay, with a background respiratory rate of 20, with 100% oxygen, right? So that means you, you start a very low uh, difference in terms of the, what do you call that, the gap, huh? the, the, the difference uh, in terms of uh, high pressure and low pressure. And only when the patient comfortable, because at the time when you, even though you put a pressure difference of 1, they, the patient will sense it because there's gas of air coming down when during the inspiration. Not they will possibly gas come, gas coming. You, you don't want the possible gas to come in suddenly gush. Then the patient will be not cooperative, right? So then you slowly titrate it up from uh from seven, six, become eight, six, and subsequently nine, six, ten, six, and twelve, six. This kind of a titration. Although this, this kind of uh, titration is available in the machine, I will show you later on how the machine do it, what we call a ramp, okay? As you will see here, it's a ramp type of setting, okay? But I still prefer a manual ramp rather than an automatic ramp, huh? okay? Because 
uh, 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 manual sometimes you can see and observe and you can see how patient tolerate it. And it can either can be go faster or go slower. But uh, when you have a RAM, you can also adjust the timing, but then this time when you adjust, the machine will go back to the initial starting point again. Huh? You will see what I mean later on when you go through, right? So this is a CPAP setup, okay? We are going to talk about the RAM after this, okay? Uh, but first of all, we uh, talk about the C-Flex first, okay? So you have a setting of CPAP of six, RAM at the moment we're off. We have a C-Flex and then you've got FRO2, right? So let's see what is C-Flex. Remember just now we talked about CPAP. When you exhale, uh, ordinary CPAP when you exhale, you do, you're going to have a resistant gas. The patient might not like it, okay? So when you look at this, okay? So the, what the, the C-Flex do is that when the patient, during an exhalation phase, the machine will try to bring down the pressure uh, from your set pressure so that the patient will not have the sense of blowing a gas again, a uh, uh, resistant. Huh? So this is what we call a C-flex. There are uh, three, two, uh, three different uh, setup, okay, either off it or C-flex of one, two, or three. Okay, So C-flex of one, they mean the pressure drop will be a little bit only, but C-flex uh, C of three, they mean it will be quite a lot. Uh, it will be dropped out quite a lot. What does it mean? Let's see the pictures now. Huh? So this is what we call a C flex of one. Okay, C flex of one. So you study the graph first. We, let's understand the graph first. Okay, so this is inhalation. Okay, inhalation. So you got flow in the tidal volume. Inhalation, flow in, tidal volume. Okay, inhalation. Okay, inhalation, inhalation. Okay, inhalation. Okay, all right. So when you see that this is the pressure, okay? So this is the inhalation, okay? But inhalation and exhalation. In inhalation, inhalation and exhalation. You didn't see much of drop pressure here, okay? Inhalation and then didn't see much of drop. As compared to this, with the C flex of three, okay? You see that inhalation and then exhalation, the pressure drop. Inhalation and the pressure drop, okay? Inhalation and pressure drop. Okay, so this is one of the quite a, uh, 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 what do you call that? Quite a good uh, uh, way of making the patient comfortable. Okay, a lot of time we very useful is only when, when the patient at the time of winning, right? When they are winning because they are strong enough already, right? So uh, if they still feel that the sense of like blowing against uh, a resistant, and then you can adjust the C flex. Uh, accordingly to, in, in, to improve the patient's uh, comfort. Yeah. Okay. As I said earlier on, I talk about the RAM. Huh? The RAM, as I say, you can increase the, uh, what do you call that, the, the pressure. The machine will increase the pressure gradually up to a set, uh, set time. Okay. So when you want to set up the RAM, you press this button, which is the RAM button. Okay. So this is what you're going to see, all right? So you're going to say, let's say you, you want to, in, you set the pressure of six, okay? The machine will start a pressure of five. If you put a RAM time of 45 minutes, okay? So the machine will slowly increase the pressure gradually and achieve pressure of six after 45 minutes, okay? Okay, so the, this is what we understand by the RAM, okay? All right. Then come to the ST mode. So this is the, what you call the ST mode. For the ST mode itself, you control the inspiry pressure, expiry pressure, the rate, the I time, the rise time, the RAM, FiO2. Okay. So this is the typical picture they're going to see. Okay. So the E, as we see just now. Okay. And now you could see that there's one color here that previously not present uh, in, in, in the previous uh, video, right? So this is what you call a time, a time cycle, huh? a time cycle whereby the machine detect there's no flow generated by the patient. So the time mode start to come in, okay? Similarly, in, in a BiPAP mode, they also have a RAM. As I told you just now, we can manually increase the, the setting, all right? But with a, with a, with a RAM set out, you can press here, okay? You can press the RAM here, you can adjust, so let's say your setup is from seven, CPAP of uh, iPad of seven six. Okay, you want the machine to do it within five minutes. Okay, 
So just press start and then machine will do it for you. Or you want to do it 10 minutes, in 10 minutes time, from the uh, pressure of five, you're going to six, seven, okay? 15 minutes, 20 minutes, okay? And so on, okay? Right. Or even 45 minutes, okay? Right. So that is about the RAM, okay? Then the other button that you're going to see in the machine is the rise. Okay, what does the rise here mean? So you have rise there are option of rise, either you off it, okay, or you rise of one or rise of five. So it shows that how fast you want the flow to go in, to rush in, in, in order to achieve the pressure, right? For example, here now, the rise is one. That means you look at the graph. The graph go very steep up, okay? Very go up very steeply because the rise time is one, okay? They mean with the rise out of one, they mean the, the flow will go really fast to achieve the pressure uh, that you set. Whereas if you put in a five, uh, the flow will go slower. Okay? You go slowly, but will achieve your pressure, right? You take some time. You take some time to achieve the pressure. All these are basically depending on the lung pathology. If you are a patient with upper airway obstruction, you, you want the air to be going fast uh, into the patient lung okay so that's why you sometimes you can pull up the right side to one you want the flow to go in very fast whereas if the patient like uh got restricted lung disease you don't want the gas to gush in too fast and then you damage the lung further you can increase the rise time most of the time i will just put a default or two sector uh, right side or two uh, to, to just uh, simplify everything uh. so this is the mode airbags that we, we seldom set okay as i say this machine is for a uh, main for uh, 20 kilo and above. The FS mode basically uh, volume uh, is a volume relatively volume control, similarly like a PRVC type mode. So you have a target volume, okay? Yeah. So you have a C C pad, minimum and maximum pressure, okay? The rate and the I time, okay? So the machine will try to titrate increasing pressure every few uh, every few breath or every few seconds to achieve the tidal volume that you set. If you look at the tidal volume, the minimum tidal volume you that uh, the machine can be set is around 200, okay? 200, let's say, which, which means that, let's say the, the tidal volume is 10 mil per kilo. So you could use it for a patient a 20 kilogram. Okay? So that's why the machine is meant for a 20 kilo patient, right? Okay. This is a very important thing that sometimes you need to look into it, right? So this is a filter and uh, there's a there's a fan at the back, right? So this fan at the back sometimes can be very, very dirty, huh? especially when you use for a long time. So this after a single patient use, then usually we need to check at the filter side, okay? Uh, to make sure that this thing actually can, can take up and then clean it. So to ensure that your machine can live a bit longer, okay? There's also another filter in the, in the machine, right? So that, that need, to be, uh, need to be changed. Uh, during the maintenance, always remind your uh, the, the, the always remind your uh, technicians. All right, and there is uh, if 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 the machine is heavily used, uh, there is a filter for you to change. Because if the filter become clogged and dirty, you find out the pressure that uh, uh, that you're going to generate is not accurate, and then the machine will start to give you problem. Yeah, pressure shock is a main issue, right? Uh, in the patients, especially on the NIV, okay. And when you start patient on the NIV, always, always review, always, always reassess. Uh, whether you want to call it, we want to reevaluate, you want to reconsider, rethink, reviews, always, always need to reassess, okay. Yeah. Um, when the first time when I start, it actually always got into trouble. So I have to be very, very careful, always review, right. So what I'm actually looking at, okay. What we're looking at is that looking at the NIV failure. The NIV failure that you want to look at is that look at the respiratory rate. You expect the respiratory rate to come down within one hour. If the respiratory rate didn't come down within one hour, then be careful. You expect the heart rate to go down or to improve within two to six hours. If it doesn't happen like that, be careful. Monitor the saturation FRO2 ratio. Okay, you, By right, it's supposed to improve within one hour. If it doesn't improve, be careful. This is what we call a, a ROCKS index. Okay, It's just that you add on the respiratory rate of your calculation, right? 
So it's a it this index, this drop index, okay? So P SPO2 over FL2 ratio, right? So if this drop index is getting higher and higher, that means you are improving, you are going to the right track. But it's dropping and dropping, huh? then you have to be very careful. It, it just gives you a one uh, indices, just a number for you to monitor because it involves the SPO2, FL2, and also the respiratory rate. Because you come, you count every, you consider everything together in the in the calculation. That gives you a, a good number for you to uh, for you to monitor. It is a number for you to monitor. Some people use it as to see whether you're going to be success or not. But more importantly is to looking at the value and follow up with the value. Also always assess work of breathing and monitor the consciousness. Right? If the patient becomes less and less conscious, then uh, you probably need to incubate them. Huh? And to always remember whether are you dealing with the isolated lung or are there any organ failure, other organ failure start to set in. Okay? So if the other organ failure start to set in, you need to intervene earlier. So when the time to change, you need to change, right? So um, as, as we discussed earlier, if, if you're a patient who have failed NIV, so if you fail, they will drag on NIV for too long, then the outcome might be not that good, okay? I thank you. <laughs> oh, I will not send you to Holland. <laughs> Any question? Chowa. Oi. It's, it's a wonderful talk. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> Just like, uh, need time to digest. Uh. Oh, sorry. That means I sent you to Holland already. <laughs> you sent me to the sky. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I, I think uh, at least uh, I think we benefit a lot uh, by knowing the machine uh, and, and the principles behind of uh, uh, NIV. Uh. I'm sure we will get back to you uh, if we have any uh, uh, questions or fine tunings needed uh, if when we use that. Uh. Ah, sure, sure. Always welcome. Uh, I really like to thank you uh, for for the wonderful talk. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, so I paint the floor for questions if you got. Got questions or not? You can type in the chat as well if you uh malu to check up. <laughs> There's a okay. chat button in the this thing in the sky. So hello, Dr. Cho, sorry, yeah. This machine ah. is designed to use in patient um less than twenty kilo of yeah. twenty kilo and above. Yeah, by right, the design of the machine is 20 kilo and above, above but then uh, we, we always use off label. Huh? We always do off label use. Like, for example, the rest mat machine that you're using in the ward sometimes, they are all basically for uh, for big, bigger patient, for basically for adult. Huh? They are not meant for pediatric. And actually, we use it off label yeah, in, uh, in uh, this thing, in uh, patient, it's a smaller patient. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then the is in this machine, right? The small, the smallest patient you can use is uh, how many kilo? I use it in a neonate as well previously. Yeah, and I I loaned to one of the neonate patient uh, NIC last time. Yeah, but as I say, I had to be very very uh careful. Yeah, and um uh one had to be know your limit <laughs> especially when the setting need to be go quite high already in a in a smaller patient yeah? uh, so if you go high pressure in a smaller patient had to be very very uh, uh, uh careful because if you put on a high high pressure so the machine will try as uh as hard as possible in order to generate the pressure so how to work hard i mean by increasing the flow so if you you know that by increasing the flow, that means the flow is, can go very very high. That is sometimes will be very very dangerous. <laughs> yeah. So as I said, this is an off label use. Yeah. So how to overcome this issue is that 
uh, make sure that your 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 mask had to be well fit, right? Try to avoid uh, uh, when you want to, when the mask become loose already. When you want to apply back. Uh, apply gently, slowly, okay, because you don't want to suddenly, oh, mask jago, so, masuk balik. Ah, so if you if you do that kind of action, so uh, then um, will be will be uh, uh, will be very dangerous. I mean, uh, you suddenly you put the mask on very fast, huh? so uh, then you the machine already try to compensate. That means to the pressure uh, to increase the pressure. That means you're going to use very high flow. Then when you want to put it onto it, then it will be very very dangerous. Yeah. And uh, uh, for a smaller child, try not to go very high pressure, right? So um, then when you need a very high pressure in a smaller child, uh, then you have to always consider intubation. What we consider high is probably uh, 16 to 18 uh, centimeter water. I mean, anything more than that. So you have to be very, always very careful, especially for a smaller child. And the bigger child, yeah, sometimes it's about 20. Uh, I, I use up to 24 before in a, in a bigger child. Yeah. So when you when you require a very high pressure, then you have to always be careful and then think of intubation uh, if needed. Yeah. So this question about the eye time. So when you talk about the eye time, uh, uh, as I say, uh, if you use, uh, uh, there, there are two ways of, of, of doing it, right? Okay. So as I say just now, uh, depending on what the concept that you want to use, right? So if, if your concept that you want to use is that you are going to support the respiratory rate, right? You're going to support the respiratory rate of the patient, okay? And uh, you're going to have a backup of uh, 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 for, for the patient. So you need to set according to the patient in respiratory, uh, respiratory time, okay? Whereas uh, for a patient uh, that you think that uh, your main purpose is for the lung recruitment, you want to recruit the lung, right? So sometimes the eye time that we put can be a bit higher, higher than the normal uh, SPT rate, which means it can be one second to 1.5 second, um, uh, provided the, the time set is setting in. So it's important like, uh, for example, in a dual pep situation, in the dual pep, uh, you can set up either uh, a lower eye time to higher eye time. In a dual pep situation, it's a very crude. This is a time mode. So in the time mode, uh, in such a way that uh, you can use it as a recruitment strategy. So uh, for example, sometimes you can pull out to about one second so that the, the lung can be recruited. Okay? Whereas if those that uh, mainly is those are apnea or the patient with apnea, then you're going to, going to put it about uh, lower to the spontaneous respiration one. Back to the V60 because uh, it is the ST mode. So the ST mode, the when you put when you put the setting onto the patient, so the the time actually that when you set is actually very much depending on the uh, the uh, the eye time for the time, whereas. Uh, for the spontaneous mode one, so it's more towards like a e cycle. Remember that just on the e cycle, and in the auto track system. So this e cycle will allow you to uh, to decide mm -hmm. when you terminate the inspiratory flow. So the termination of inspiratory flow is very much depending on the uh, the, 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 the 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 decelerating flow during the inspiratory time, right? So that, that is quite a, uh, uh, maybe it's a quite a complex uh, uh, complicated uh, things. Yeah. And basically, uh, you're detaining uh, uh, depending on the time uh, how much the inspiratory flow drop to a certain percentage. Yeah. So um, as I say, the, the the for the ST mode that you're going to set in the machine is basically meant for the time cycle. Right. The time cycle means that if the patient do not breathe spontaneously or the patient uh, do not able to trigger the machine so the the eye time we're going to uh, the the time cycle is going to take over so this time cycle when you take over you can uh, either put it in a low eye time uh, or the normal uh, in speedy time or you can put a relatively long eye time for mainly for recruitment strategy yeah so there is a two uh, different uh, strategy that you can do Uh, there is a question by Gabi Tsai uh, 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 in the chat. Uh. Hi, Lin. Hi, Lin. Irene. Oh, Irene. 
Hiring is a presentation in cupping. Oh, okay, okay. So, uh, you're, you're highly alum, I mean, in your, in your machine, right, uh, Irene? Uh, in the V60, huh? If you do not find, if you do not find any uh, uh, significant leak in, in the system, then you have to probably uh, <laughs> get the machine uh, sorted out. Yeah, I think not sure that your machine got any problem or not. Uh, because uh, the, the high leak is measured by the machine. It's a measurement of the uh, uh, of the machine by itself. So whether the uh, the machine calculation and calibration will be a problem or not. So that is the thing. If you already find out your system do not have much significant leak, then will be your machine uh, faulty. And that you need to be uh, put into it. Yeah. The eye time, the eye time for different edge group, as I mentioned just now. So if uh, because if you are using ST mode. So the T, uh, the 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 I time that you're going to set is basically for the time, for the time mode, not the spontaneous mode, it's but rather the time mode. So you can put the I time into a normal inspiracy I time, whereby if the patient do not breathe and then the machine will take over. Or sometimes what I do is that uh, the patient with bad lung and uh, not able to trigger, um, and then the, a lot of time the ventilations are all uh, by the time mode, right? So in this situation, I will put the I time really long. Yeah. So for a neonate, uh, for an infant, sometimes I put one second. For a bigger child, 1.5 second. So it, it, it is made into a, something like a, a bi-level type of ventilation. I mean, you have a time for the inspiratory time, which is a bit longer, in order to recruit the lung. Yeah. What's the cutoff point to big child? Uh, what is the cutoff point to consider as big child to limit the pressure? A lot of time, uh, five years and above. Yeah. So. Anything fire and below, uh, so 18 pressure is the uh, is a is a safe limit. So anything uh, uh, fire and above, yeah. So I sometimes go up to 24 uh, is my limit. But it, it all depending on the it, it, uh, it all depending on the patient's um, underlying lung condition and also uh, uh, out to patient. Uh, I mean uh, uh, case by case basis, yeah. So always, you, you, when you start on someone on NIV, you always uh, remember that you need to uh, see how the patient is doing. Right? Okay. So if you're needing that relatively high pressure, uh, more than 24, usually it's, uh, it's time for you to <laughs> think of other strategy yeah? so for, more than, for more than five years. So, yeah. But um, having said that, it's all depending on case to case basis. Oh, uh, 24 is not a magic number, 18 is also a, not a magic number. But uh, always look at the patient. Uh, uh, what to call that uh, uh, situation? Ah, <laughs> uh, ah, uh, How do you get your background in the middle of the forest? Uh? This one, huh? I think when when you have uh, when you there, there's function one, there's function one. Oh, it's by the computer, is it? Ah, ah, I'm not in the forest. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I, I have you, are you all into the, the forest. forest. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if there is no, if there is uh, no more question, I think we, we thank you again now. Okay, okay. Uh, for your time and for your effort. But oh. we will sure get back to you. Can, can. I will, I will share the I will share the presentations uh, to you. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, hi Johnny. Johnny, what you want to say? Uh, Johnny, Johnny. Uh, the, the respiratory rate, huh? The what is the maximum respiratory rate that you can set? Okay. So, uh, so in a bigger child, the respiratory rate, uh, I will go on a normal physiological respiratory rate. And as you remember, this is a time mode. Yeah, it's a time mode. Uh, you, you are setting onto the time mode, right? Okay. So in the time mode, I mean, it's a basically a backup rate, uh, a backup rate. Huh? So for a backup rate to occur, so it, it all depending on the patient's uh, 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 age and size. Yeah. So smaller child, then you you want to make a backup rate of uh. 
maybe 25 to 30, huh? so type of neonatal age group. Bigger child, then depending on the physiology, you, you, it's basically a backup how much you want. Yeah? But as I said, uh, in terms of like, if you want to do it as a recruitment strategy, right? so a lot of time I will, I will put a default of 20 uh, for, for most of the patients. I mean, you, you, you want the intermittent high pressure to go up uh, for 20 breaths in between. Right? So they mean, uh, so in, in a minute, you want the 20, um, more or less like a side, you know, if you, if you want to, uh, if you want to uh, 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 make a, a, a comparison, huh? so, so like an invasive ventilator, you have a side breath, okay? So you want to put uh, 20 side breath uh, in, 20 short side breath uh, in, in this kind of uh, patients, okay? So in order to recruit the lung, yeah. Yeah, usually I will, I will uh, depend on the, uh, the FRO2 uh, requirement wise is also depending on the patient to patient strategy. Yeah, okay. So uh, I, will be, I will be start to jitter when the FRO2 more than 50%. Right? So that is uh, the cutoff point. So when you anything uh, oxygen requirement uh, more than 50%, uh, uh, then you will be considered. Yeah. So a lot of time we will try to adjust the pressure first. Okay. And uh, we have, when you have a you adjust the pressure until you get a, a certain good tidal volume, right? Then you, after that, you start to titrate down the titrate down the uh, oxygenation. You remember, we always need to recruit the lung, right? So uh, that's why the pressure uh, is much more important uh, as compared to the FRO2, right? So when you have a certain amount of uh, pressure that you set, and then you're able to recruit the lung properly already, so that's the time for you to calm down the FRO2. So your FR2 cannot be low anything less than 50% after you have recruit the lung. So that's the time I think you need to intervene. <laughs> yeah, you need to um, uh, 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 change your strategy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The highest EPEC I ever try, yeah. The highest EPEC I ever try is uh, uh, on a patient with uh, airway obstruction, right? Uh, uh, airway obstruction up to about ten centimeter. That that is the highest that we ever try, yeah. Uh, anything more, more than that, I, I'll be more jittery, especially for uh, NIV, yeah. But you had to know that uh, uh, the 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 reason I went out to a pressure of ten is also especially for NIV, because we are talking about uh, non-invasively, we're putting someone on uh, pressure, right? So because uh, it's quite different from the in invasive, huh? in in quite different from invasive. Invasive, we can go quite high. Huh? So when, when you need something, uh, especially when parent chima, we need something, anything uh, more than eight or more than 10, that's a, that's a time that you need to consider. Uh, I have to be very, very careful because I think, uh, it, it, using the NIV to recruit this kind of lung sometimes will be very, very challenging, might, might not be successful. Yeah. So that's the time that you have to consider information. When I say that the maximum EPAP that I use is that depending on the patient condition, because I have this patient with a tracheal malaysia. Um, with the tracheal malaysia, when we, we, when we perform a scope, we, we notice that the minimum pressure for the tracheal malaysia to be open is about 8 centimeter. So in order to overcome the pressure, I put the patient on EPAP of 10. So, so that's the, the time that I, I try. Yeah? So uh, I do always remember when you anything, when you are EPAP or non-invasive, anything more than eight, you have to be very, very careful. Right? So we need anything 10 and then uh, you better intubate. <laughs> yeah. Is EPAP already high, can set the eye time higher? So when you EPAP e high already, then, um, uh, it depends on what's the level, so uh, and what is your consideration, what you what you mean to be high, huh? So if 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 the EPEC already more than eight, then you better intubate. Don't don't adjust anything anymore. Yeah, uh, and then the eye time is I say the eye time we will set the eye time uh, basically based on what we had discussed early on. Yeah. How about EPEC or bad lung? So pulmonary melanosis. Uh, the, the principles still hold in, in whatever lung pathology. As I say, uh, we all have, always remember we have limit in terms of NIV, right? So there's, there's much we can do. So if we drag on too long in a patient with a, a, a severe uh, lung diseases that we didn't intervene uh, uh, earlier, 
no doubt there are times that <laughs> yeah no no doubt there are no doubt there are times that we can uh, uh, by, by God grace everything went well and then we put on relatively high setting and then the patient improved. But uh, as a general rule of thumb, so when the patient require high setting or NIV, uh, by all means, uh, you, you, you need to consider intubate them. Yeah. So the, the EPAP for bad lung pulmonary melidosis, I think the principle is still the same, right? Uh, when you have needing pressure of 10, EPAP of 10, then you have to always be careful, get ready to intubate them. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Click, click, click. Okay. I think two hours of your time, so we didn't time limit. Okay. I'll, I'll try to send uh, the video for you, the recording as well, and then the. Uh, uh, what do you call that? The the presentation and also there is a actually there's a handbook for V60. I'll I'll WhatsApp to you as well. Yeah, so that you can um share with your uh, colleague. Yeah, for the long. Yeah. Uh, thank thank you, Chow. Thank okay, you. Thank okay. You. Right. Thanks. Thanks. Right. Okay. Bye. See you next time. Bye. 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 <laughs> Baby, station.